Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Emma Morton and I'd like to warmly welcome you all to today's Crest BD Talk BD event uh, on strategies to help you flourish while managing a mental health condition at school or um, university. I'm joined today by our guest speaker, Dr. Stephen Barnes, one of the Crest BD network leads and uh, frankly renowned psychology lecturer at the University of British Columbia. And we're also joined by Tracy Windsor, the president of Kaleidoscope, a mental health peer support group that originated at UBC Vancouver to help support student wellbeing. Uh, we have a lot of new viewers joining us today, and we're very glad to have you here. Thank you for taking time out of your busy days to join us. Um, in case you don't know about us, uh, this event is being run by Chris BD. And we are a network of academics, clinicians, and people with lived experience dedicated to improving knowledge uh, about bipolar disorder and sharing that back with the community through events like this. Talk BD was started by Crest in March 2020 as a way to provide some support for the new challenges that people were facing during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we received a really enthusiastic response to this webinar format. Um, we think it's a really ideal way to share evidence-based information and tools with the broadest possible audience. Although we do have a specific focus on bipolar disorder, uh, much of the advice that we'll be sharing today will also be relevant to people experiencing other kinds of mental health difficulties and also any family or supports looking to assist someone that they care about. It's now October and learners in North America have recently returned to school. And for anyone, school and any kind of further education or training can come with a lot of stresses, um, whether you live with a, a mental health concern or not. Um, but we know that for young people with bipolar disorder, and particularly at this transition to post-secondary education, that this can be a really challenging period that uh, has some significant impacts on quality of life. Um, many mental health difficulties emerge for the first time at this, this age. Um, and it can be quite complex learning to manage symptoms at the same time as navigating new levels of independence, whether that involves living outside of the family home for the first time, having to self-direct your, your learning in new ways, uh, or coping with uh, changes to your schedule. Um, in addition, it can be harder to know where to go for help in the post-secondary system as compared to high school. Uh, you have smaller classroom environments, and more people uh, taking a closer eye on um, how you're going. And of course, uh, in 2021, this has all gotten a lot more complicated with remote learning. So you are not alone in finding this challenging and our uh, presenters today will be sharing some advice to help you manage this time. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to go through some quick introductions, starting with myself. I am a researcher at the University of British Columbia, working with the Press BD team to build and evaluate a new self-management app to help people optimize their quality of life. Uh, I'm originally from Australia, so I'm still kind of wrapping my head around this idea of starting the school year in September. Um, but after a couple of years in Vancouver, I'm seeing the value in kind of taking the summer easy. And um, I've been using that time to get outdoors as much as possible. I find walking and hiking quite meditative. And even when it rains, which is quite often in Vancouver at this time of year, uh, I'm enjoying long walks to take in the uh, changing fall colours. So I'll now pass the mic to Stephen to introduce himself. Um, we'd love to hear about where you work, your involvement with Crest, um, as well as one thing you do to relax in your downtime. Thanks, Emma. Uh, so I'm Stephen Barnes. I'm uh, associate head. Of, um, I was associate head. I'm the associate professor of teaching at University of British Columbia in the Department of Psychology. I'm, I'm going to be the neuros director of the new undergraduate program in neuroscience, and I'm also the deputy co-lead of Crest BD, um, the lead being uh, Aaron Mahalik. And um, I'm working with Emma on, a, on an app uh, called Polaris, which is going to be helping people with bipolar disorder manage, uh, manage their symptoms and illness in general. Um, and I'll pass it to Tracy. Hi, I'm Tracy. I'm going to apologize for my audio where I am. The internet connection isn't the best, so my audio quality also isn't the best. Um, but hopefully you'll be able to hear me okay. And once those um, audio captions are turned on, hopefully it'll pick up what I'm saying. 
But yeah, so I am um, a Master of Social Work student at Dalhousie. I've been involved with the Kaleidoscope Mental Health Support Society for about 10 years. And I'm here today to share a bit about my experience studying with bipolar. Thank you both. Um, I'll also mention that we have um, some behind the scenes helpers um, online with us today. Uh, Kaden, who is helping us keep the gremlins out of Zoom, and Laura, who will be helping with the chat and um, answering questions on our Facebook page. Um, so just to flag a couple of things about the format of this talk um, before we really get stuck into it. We have people joining us via Zoom as well as watching on Facebook Live. Um, we will be having a presentation from Stephen and Tracy, but we'll be having a lot of Q&A time afterwards. And um, if you have questions, please put them in the, the Zoom Q&A box, um, or you can put them in a Facebook comment or anonymously via the Press BD Talk BD page, and um, we'll get to them after the main presentation. Uh, but for now, I'll hand it over to Stephen and Tracy to um, talk a little bit more about studying and mental health. Thanks, Emma. Um, so I just I wanted to preface this uh, talk and discussion uh, just by noting, at least for me, that I'm not a clinician. Um, so I'm not going to be giving you any clinical advice, and nor will I be giving you clinical advice to your questions. But I will be, and I'm assuming Tracy will be as well, uh, sharing our experiences and um, what we what we found for ourselves was helpful. So I live with um, uh, BD, uh, bipolar disorder, type one. Um, and I've had bipolar disorder, uh, a diagnosis of bipolar disorder since I was in my undergraduate degree, um, which was <laughs> a little bit of time ago, but I won't say how long. Um, did you want to touch on anything before we start, Tracy? Uh, no, well, just the same. Yeah, I'm not a clinician either. Yeah. I have peer support experience, but by no means, yeah. Yeah. So I'm just going to share my screen. There are a few things I like to um, preface uh, these sorts of talks with, and one has to do with the... Um, the distinction between mental health and mental illness, and I just like to bring people up to speed with this, is not everyone's aware. And we talk, we often use the terms mental health and mental illness um, as being on opposite, opposite ends of a spectrum. Uh, the reality is a lot more complex. And um, what you can see here is uh, the, the conceptual work of Dr. Corey Keyes. And what Keys has proposed uh, is basically that uh, mental health and mental illness can exist on, on, on two continua. And this is important when you're talking about mental health and mental illness, because a lot of people with mental illness live quite well and have good mental health. Um, and so uh, I'd like to think that Tracy and I are examples of individuals who live with a mental illness, but we actually maintain good mental health uh, for most of the time. Um, I also wanted to uh, also, uh, just acknowledge the breadth and depth of some of the stressors that uh, post-secondary students, I'm assuming many of you on the line are post-secondary students, um, endure uh, during the course of their, their degree. And uh, what I'd like to point out especially is that this one, uh, these are all different sorts of stressors. The one I'm highlighting there is uh, meeting expectations for oneself. Um, and that's that's listed by uh, by self-report as being one of the most severe and most frequent uh, experiences of post-secondary students. That is, failing to leave up, lead, lead up to um, uh, to live up to one's own expectations of oneself uh, can be very stressful, and it's something that, if anything, you can target quite quite readily. Uh, the la the last thing I want to mention is that. Um, uh, I just want to acknowledge the uh, severe amount of stress that COVID has placed on all of us, especially, and this is especially true of, of people in the, in the age group of 15 to 24. So we know this from research that people in that age group have uh, endured many more stressors on average than, than older people during this pandemic. And this has been true particularly of individuals in post-secondary institutions for a variety of reasons, and there's many. Uh, including the, the chronic disruption of routines we've all experienced, um, the social isolation, um, the academic stressors, for example, from transitioning to online learning uh, and then back to in-person learning and back and forth all over the place, and also the economic stressors, which can be severe. Um, and it, we know that about 50 to 60 percent of people uh, in North America have experienced either job loss directly uh, or indirectly through their household. Um, and this has placed an extra, uh, an extra, extra severe stress on people 
going to post-secondary. Uh, yeah. And I think now we're going to, um, Tracy and I are just gonna talk about our experiences and hopefully that'll, that'll give way to some good questions from this audience. I don't know if you wanted to start, Tracy. Yeah, sure. Um, so my diagnosis of bipolar came also when I was in my undergrad. It was after the at the end of my second year of university. Um, I kind of think of my fall semesters as my depressive semesters, and my January to April as my manic semesters. Um, so my my first depressive episode was when I first moved to Vancouver. I grew up in Nova Scotia, and I was uh, I was brand new. In high school, I didn't really try very hard. I applied to UBC, but I didn't get in, so I went to SFU. And that involved a really long commute for me, over an hour, which I really wasn't used to. Um, so that was hard to get uh, to get used to. I, you know, first time moving away from home, didn't have many social connections, uh, found it hard to, to meet people. Um, so I had this, this sense of isolation, which gradually got better. And, yeah, my mood just shot down really low. Um, I started to see a counselor just to see if there was something that could help. And just the counselor I saw didn't really help me much. Um, went home for Christmas to Nova Scotia. And when I came back, I kind of wanted to make a concerted effort to to enjoy my life in Vancouver and to enjoy um, my, my studying. But it was also really hard for me because as I mentioned in high school, I didn't very well prepare for university. So that stress was extremely difficult as well. Um, so then I had a manic episode in the in the, um, the spring semester. And at the time, I didn't know it was mania. I just felt very energized, very social, um, also very distractible and not really studying. Um, my grades suffered as a result. And kind of some shenanigans happened over the next six months. And by September, actually really by July, I was in a depression again. And so then from July to December, very depressed. Um, but that kind of gave me some time to focus on my studies because I wasn't really doing much of anything else, but, but having that really low, low. Um, and then mania happened again. And so this time when mania happened, I experienced psychosis as well. So I was hospitalized and given some medication and the once I came out of my psychosis, the stigma of that really weighed me down. And I tried to go back to school to study and I just I couldn't. I was taking two courses. I couldn't concentrate. I was failing, failed my midterms and decided to withdraw um, and just focus on my health. So I took that time off. I was seeing the early psychosis intervention program who were giving me lots of skills and and treatment and sending me to um, places for cognitive behavioral therapy and stuff, which were really, really helpful for me. And so I tried to go back to school again in January, but at this time I didn't have very much direction. I had initially entered university because I wanted to be a killer whale trainer. <laughs> Since I was six years old, that was my goal. Um, and so I was studying for these courses that I really didn't care about. I didn't enjoy biology, chemistry, physics. I, I didn't care for that at all. So once I went back again um, in, the, in the winter, I started trying some different courses. And again, it just really wasn't working for me. So I took about another year off. I was in and out of hospital several more times. Uh, I received electroconvulsive therapy to help with my depression. And then I decided to uh, change my focus to psychology, which I really liked. I then tried out sociology, which I liked even more. And then I was introduced to social work, which I fell in love with. And so social work and peer support have been my main two interests now for about six or seven years. And I've discovered ways to help my mental health and to, to find a balance um, and a large part of that was slowing down and taking fewer courses and not pushing myself too hard, having a low stress load. And it's been really helping for me, helpful for me. And so I look forward to, to sharing a bit more a little later. Back to you, Stephen. Thanks, Tracy. Um, so I, I've lived with BD um, 
uh, since I was in my second year of my undergrad. At that time, uh, I became severely depressed. And in fact, for the next four years, I lived with a diagnosis of major depressive disorder. So in my second year, I, I got quite sick. I wasn't hospitalized at that time. Um, I sort of endured through my undergraduate degree um, with a severe depression, uh, which was obviously very difficult. And it's very difficult for anyone to function with a major depressive disorder, um, let alone at university. Um, while I was doing that, I was not uh, really adopting during that time a good healthy approach to managing my condition. Um, in fact, I was pushing myself more than I needed to. And that's one thing I actually regret. I didn't do something like what Tracy did, uh, which was managing her your mental health while you're actually dealing with a mental illness. Um, uh, for me, it, it I got into graduate school after that, but then I had a, a manic episode um, at the beginning of my graduate degree. Um, actually, what's called a mixed episode, but I won't go into what that means. Uh, so during that manic episode, uh, I started to be obviously very creative, um, not obviously, but it often is the case that one's very creative during these during these bouts. Um, and I got I got so manic that people were uh, telling me that I was talking too fast. I might be doing that right now. I have a <laughs> tendency to do that um, and uh, all sorts of other symptoms. And eventually my psychiatrist at that time uh, hospitalized me for a period of, I think, two to three weeks. Um, and after that, I, it was sort of a big wake up call being hospitalized um, in terms of uh, what I needed to do for myself going forward. And I decided at that time that um, it would be best if I took that year off of my degree. Um, and then I came back uh, a year later and, and I finished up. It was it was difficult, but I managed to uh, spread things out a bit more, take fewer classes all at once. And that's actually one nice thing about a graduate degree is you do have a lot more flexibility in that regard. You still have that flexibility as an undergraduate, and we'll be sort of touching upon that issue off and on uh, throughout um, the rest of our talk. Um, and I basically made my way through two graduate degrees. And during that time, I had a few, I, I had intermittent episodes, be it depression or mania. And I've had those um, for the duration of my career. I mean, I've, I've learned over, the to over that time that uh, there are certain things, there are certain triggers for me, uh, that, I'm, that things that I need to avoid or manage better uh, in order to uh, maintain my mental health. Um, and, you know, as recently as two years ago, I had a major depressive episode. Um, I'm lucky to be in a position at a university that understands um, mental health issues and uh, was considered enough to give me time off to manage my symptoms. Um, yeah. Uh, did you have anything else you wanted to say right now, Tracy? Or do we just want to? Um, no, let's, yeah. let's, let's keep going. Okay. Um, yeah, so I've taught about student mental health and I've done research on student mental health for some time. Um, and yeah, during that, um, during the time that I've studied that and during the time that I've been working on doing research related to bipolar disorder, I've learned a lot of uh, techniques and self-management uh, skills uh, that are readily available to people now. If you go to the crestbd.ca website, there's plenty of resources there for self-management. Um, some are applicable directly, you'll find them applicable directly to you. Others are um, maybe less so, but um, everyone has their own self-management strategies that they learn to, um, to, main, to, to keep. Um, one, two things that I found very helpful for my self-management of my symptoms is um, volunteering my time uh, to causes that I feel are quite worthwhile. Um, I, I realized early on that when I when I was busy trying to help others, it actually took it was a distraction really from what I was going through, um, and it also helped me by seeing what helped them. It also helped me see what I, what works for me as well. The other thing I do um, quite a bit to manage my um, my my symptoms is to uh, paint and draw. So I've always been a bit of a visual artist and um, that's something that I do um, and sometimes I'll even take you know a couple of days off work um, just to uh, engage in those activities if I feel that I'm getting too stressed out. Yeah. So a major part of obviously living with a mental health condition um, while you're going to school is 
uh, managing your workload. Um, and uh, one thing I would like to say as a piece of advice to anyone who's struggling with a mental health issue uh, during your undergraduate degree, at that time, it feels a lot like you, you have to get things done in four years, you have to take five courses a year, depending on the university you're going to. Um, and th that pressure is to a large degree, as I hinted at earlier, um, very much uh, self-imposed. Um, there are certain expectations, depending on whether you have a scholarship or so forth, to maintain a certain number of courses per year. Uh, but th there is wiggle room there. And especially if you have um, an accommodation through your university, which is critical, um, if you're dealing with mental health issues, you need to seek resources to help you uh, with those situations, including uh, potentially getting a reduced course load, uh, which is very important, um, uh, I think. Uh, and it's probably one of the first things one, sh one should consider if one's mental health is deteriorating. Um, I don't know if you wanted to comment on that, Tracy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, yeah after my diagnosis, I, my, my mental health team encouraged me to take a reduced course load and I hadn't even really considered it because everybody I knew in university was doing a full time course load. That's just what you did. And so when I kind of realized that I could do part time and then I tried part time and it was so much more manageable. I just kept up with part time studies, taking one course at a time, kind of retraining my brain or even just learning in general how to how to study because I didn't I didn't do very well um, in high school and, and before before university. And so taking that time to with, with less pressure to focus on my courses um, and it gave me time to to find what I enjoy both in school and time to find out what I enjoy doing outside of school. Um, like I mentioned, I got involved in peer support. This was back really 2010, 2011, and I've been able to see different areas in work and what I enjoy doing for work as well and getting experience that way, which has been hugely helpful for me to have this extra time to, to learn about that how I enjoy peer support work and, and have the time to pursue other interests. Um, and so all in all, from start to finish, it took me 13 years to get my undergrad degree. But I, you know, I worked hard and I, I did get those good grades and I got into a master's program basically immediately. And so, you know, looking back, I, ha I have no regrets for taking that long to finish my degree. It was, it's, it's been great. I really enjoyed my undergrad degree. Yeah, that's that's one thing I, I wish I would have done differently, Tracy, which is basically trying to do at least um, a part time course load as my during an undergrad. I was under the impression at the time that I had to do it that way. It was my own sort of self-imposed rule. I don't know why I was thinking that. And I would encourage people, if you are thinking that way, to sort of question yourself and ask why, um, why you think you need to complete it in four years. It's usually self-imposed. Um, it's true, of course, that there's a financial cost associated with going to school, but often if you go part time, you could potentially t do other things that could potentially be a source of employment uh, to pay your help pay, pay your way through school and also maintain more of a balance while you're completing your degree degree as well. Yeah. I guess we can move into um, accessing resources. Yeah, and so. Uh, for me, the accessibility resource centers have been hugely helpful for getting accommodations for when I need them, whether it be extra time on exams or some leniency around late assignments if I, if I, if I needed some extra time. And it's just nice to know that you have that. And I have used the resources anytime I had an exam, I would take the extra time just because I didn't know how I'd be feeling that day. And Sometimes I didn't need the extra time, but it was great to know that I, that I had it. Um, and so usually every post-secondary has some kind of disability or accessibility resource center. And if you have a doctor who can vouch for you, um, you may be eligible for some accommodations, which I think should be available anyway, kind of that universal design and learning, but that's not the system we're currently operating in. Um, so that's been very helpful. Uh, peer support has been helpful for me, uh, particularly the kaleidoscope. 
Mental Health Support Society. And a lot of universities now I'm finding do have some kind of peer support program. So at UBC, it uh, used to be called Speakeasy, now it's AMS Peer Support. And uh, other universities, I don't, I don't have any other examples, but that's UBC. Counseling, post-secondary, often have counseling, uh, which have groups like CBT that I mentioned that were hugely helpful for me. And you might have some uh, health benefits to see a counselor. Um, so I'm doing that right now with my, my health benefits from Dalhousie to see a counselor. Um, and financial aid. So for myself, Student Aid BC has completely funded my education, whether through um, very little use of loans, mostly grants and bursaries. So Student Aid BC has a very comprehensive like well-funded uh, grant and bursaries for students with disabilities. And so a lot of people I talk to aren't aware of this. And so if you do have some kind of mental health diagnosis, um, it can really help with, with finances. Um, so that really funded, yeah, the majority of my education. Once I was diagnosed, I applied for student aid funding every semester and it, it came through. There, there are some limitations, so just kind of check out the eligibility, um, but definitely worth looking into. There are also some scholarships through nonprofit organizations. Canadian Mental Health Association, for example, has a number of scholarships and bursaries. Um, and, and yeah, some Google searches, you can probably find some as well. And so other resources, I mean, seek help when you need it. I, yeah, for me, I, um, I was kind of involuntarily got treatment initially. Didn't really know, you know, what was going on. I had some family um, take me to hospital and that was how it started. Um, but everybody has a different way that they enter kind of the mental health system or, or getting treatment. So especially now, I mean, when I was first getting, when I was first, you know, getting diagnosed was 2008. And since then, there's so many more mental health resources and people are so much more open to talking about it. Um, so like Canadian Mental Health Association has resources, uh, the Crest BD Bipolar Wellness Center, which I think has been shared in the chat. Uh, I access the Early Psychosis Intervention Program. So if you or someone you know is maybe experiencing psychosis, to get in touch with them. Very uh, like low wait times, if any, great resource. Um, and in the Vancouver area, kind of for general information, there's the VGH, uh, Vancouver General Hospital Access and Assessment Center, uh, where you can call or go and just kind of get an initial assessment and, and talk to somebody. Also student health at universities a great place to start as well. Yeah, resources have gotten amazing over the last um, 30 years, I can tell you that. Um, when I was a, an undergraduate student at UBC in the 90s, I'm now telling you how old I am, um, yeah, there were not, there was a dearth of resources. Um, the Center for Accessibility was called the something different at the time, and it wasn't as focused or uh, as easily acknowledging uh, mental health issues as a potential source of disability at the time, believe it or not. Um, but that's that's the way it was. Uh, so I think part of my struggles as an undergraduate was due in part to a lack of resources um, and lack of awareness. Uh, and those things have thankfully changed. Uh, one thing I want to acknowledge is that during COVID, most universities, um, there's actually been a systematic study of this, have had a lot of trouble trying to communicate to their student populations about what online resources are available to them. They do exist, most universities have responded, but getting that information out to the students has been a problem. Um, so usually, you know, if you go to the Center for Accessibility website at UBC now, for example, there's lots of online uh, resources for you, including uh, virtual sessions with, with, with a counselor there. Um, so please look into those. You might, they may not be at your fingertips, but they are there for you. Thank you both so much for being so open and sharing about your experiences as well as um, particularly uh, helping, helping people navigate the really complex um, uh, system of, of resources that are available and unfortunately sometimes a little bit opaque and uh, hard to access.
And I, um, again, really appreciate you sharing your experiences. Stephen, with what you were talking about with expectations being such a high source of stress, I think it's incredibly valuable to have people um, share and normalize um, their own uh, experiences, given that, um, you know, it's, it's sometimes hard to know what other people are struggling with um, that can kind of contribute to expectations to be to be perfect. Um, so what I'd like to do now is leap into some of the questions that we've been getting. Um, so Stephen and Tracy, our first question, as someone with social anxiety disorder, how do I convince myself to seek additional support on campus if I'm feeling anxious to do so? Um, I always flip back and forth on whether or not I need extra help or whether I should just try and top it out. <laughs> you can go ahead, Tracy. Um, yeah, I was going to say for a, a good way to reach out if anxiety is really preventing you from doing things that you want to do is to get some treatment for that first. And I know that that's kind of what you're mentioning, looking for treatment, but to, to get a treatment. So for me, uh, I had a lot of anxiety as well. And so cognitive behavioral therapy was a way for me to learn healthy ways to cope with it so that it wasn't stopping me from doing things that I wanted to do. And from there, I was then able to, you know, I was empowered to do all kinds of things. So CBT, I definitely recommend, um, you know, being brave and, and trying some, something out. Um, would be my suggestion for a first step. Yeah, cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, what Tracy touched on there is a great uh, treatment that's available to people, um, especially for anxiety disorders and, dis and depression. Uh, there's a lot, lot of evidence backing its use. And um, there's a lot of online CBT programs now. There's even apps for CBT that you might want to look into if you're dealing with that sort of social anxiety and it's preventing you from seeking uh, help. Uh, that might be an initial first step is to do something that's, you know, in, your, in the privacy of your own home and then maybe reach out for additional supports. Um, I found uh, personally that uh, uh, peer support groups are, are an excellent way, a first step at, at, at reaching out for help. Um, it, first of all, normalizes your experiences quite a bit. Uh, by speaking to other people, especially students at, at your university or college who might be going through the same thing. You realize you're not alone, which is a very important first step. And um, yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a great way to, to get, make your move towards seeking help. Thank you both. And I think as well, like Stephen said before, um, you know, questioning whether or not um, the thoughts that we're having are healthy or unhealthy expectations, whether toughing it out is maybe uh, an unhealthy expectation of yourself and where that's coming from might um, help break down some of those barriers to reaching out for support. Uh, the next question that we have is about, um, I suppose, disclosure. And I think Tracy, you touched on this uh, a little bit earlier and today when you were sharing your story. Um, uh, the question I ask do you feel that some mental illnesses are sometimes overly um, glamorized on campus and can that be harmful? I feel that if I tell people about my depression, it is much more socially acceptable. But if I mention psychosis or the things I do when I am manic, uh, it doesn't get the same treatment. So how do you manage dealing with the different levels of support you, you receive when disclosing different aspects of your um, uh, mental illness? You go ahead, Tracy. We're both turning on our mics at this. Um, yeah, I think mental illnesses like depression and anxiety are definitely talked about a lot more and maybe because they are more prevalent that they're kind of the first ones that seem to be kind of um, more normalized in the population. And so other ones like, um, bipolar, psychosis, borderline personality disorder, there are still all of these other ones that still have a lot of stigma attached to them. And so I'm not sure if I resonate, if the word glamorize resonates with me, but just like kind of a level of general, like normalization, like, oh yeah, depression and anxiety, like almost everybody experiences that kind of thing. Um, whereas bipolar, psychosis, schizophrenia, schizoaffective, borderline, 
those still have a lot of stigma attached to them. And so I'm hoping over time with people sharing about those as well, that stigma around those will break down too. But, um, but yeah, for myself, in terms of disclosing, um, the work that I do is, is peer-based work. Um, and so it's kind of automatic that I have some kind of mental health disorder. Um, and I don't necessarily always disclose that it is bipolar disorder. Um, not to intentionally, you know, not say it, but just that, you know, it's not like every time I enter a room and I'm a peer that I'm like, hi, I'm Tracy, I have bipolar, um, but just that I identify as a peer. And I have definitely had, you know, lost friendships and things along the way, but um, through peer support, honestly, is how I've met a lot of my friends. And, and yeah, I mean, we all, we all have other like psychosis and stuff too. And so, to find that friend group wh where people do understand and don't have that stigma like some people more in the general population might um, has been has been great. Yeah, thanks, Tracy. Um, yeah, I just wanted to you know, echo that sentiment sentiment that um, glamorizes I don't think is necessarily what's going on. Um, at least in my opinion, I, I think it has more to do with prevalence. Um, that is that uh, anxiety disorders and depression. Um, I'm, um, are far more frequent than some of these other conditions that Tracy mentioned. Um, that doesn't mean that those conditions aren't common on campuses. I mean, if you look at the rates, the prevalence rates for bipolar disorder, they're about 2%, which means that that's a lot of people on, on a standard U university campus that have, have bipolar disorder. Um, and so, yeah, disclosure can be a bit more difficult in those circumstances when you have one of these um, less common conditions. Um, but um, there are venues where you can actually practice disclosure. And I, I want to emphasize too that self-disclosure is one of the only tried and true methods for battling self-stigma. Um, and I'm not saying you should go out and, and just announce to the public on the street, walk into Donald's Market or the Safeway and say, I have bipolar disorder. This is more about talking about to other people and openly about your condition. And this can start in, a, in the context of a peer support group quite readily. Why is this important? So, well, self-stigma we know is probably the most debilitating aspect of stigma, that self-stigma is when you've internalized um, those social stigmas uh, that, um, that you experienced during your life or, or those social stigmas that you've witnessed um, either in films or media uh, that you've then internalized and, and sort of are discriminating against yourself in a way, stigmatizing yourself. And, and self-disclosure will help with that. And it can be incremental. You could start off at a peer support group and then maybe move to where Tracy and I are right, are right now, which is talking on an open channel on the internet. Um, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I think there's some really good ideas in there, both in terms of um, getting comfortable with talking about your diagnosis at peer support groups um, and uh, that, that Disclosure can be a really good way to combat self-stigma. And I think we have some resources on our CrossBD um, relationships page, um, which talks about how to perhaps evaluate uh, which relationships in your life might be um, safe to, to disclosing. Um, so perhaps we can share that in the chat as well. Um, I'll ask two questions at the same time because they're on a very similar topic and they're really to do with um, uh, how perhaps to explain um, or deal with the impacts of mental illness when it comes to grad school applications. Um, so I'll, I'll ask them both because there might be similar points of feedback. Um, how do you explain a low GPA on a grad school application? And the second question is, does spreading out courses look okay on a grad school application? I'm going to let you answer that first, Tracy. I've, I've experienced this is much more remote for me <laughs> given my age, so I'll let you answer it first. Um, so first, for low GPAs, I heard that there's a way that you can kind of justify them or um, substantiate them by extenuating circumstances. So I'm not sure what the process of that is, if that comes from through ordering transcripts. Um, sorry, I don't have a more firm answer on that, but something to do with extenuating circumstances. Um, I've heard when applying for 
a grad program that for if you have relatively low grades to kind of say like, hey, I was really struggling during this time. Um, that was why my grades are, are low kind of thing. And I was worried about that too, about having courses really spread out. Like I said, 13 years from start to finish, I was like, that's not going to look good on a transcript. However, um, it may have been due to also the other things that I was getting involved with that allowed me to get experience in my field. So all of the peer support work that I've done over the last 10 years, you know, I've plugged it into a resume and it turned out to be a fair bit of work. And so that's been another benefit of, of you know, taking a reduced course load. Um, so it didn't impact me. Um, also, when I was filling out the application, you can select that you're a student with a disability, which, you know, brings folks' attention to that um, who are looking at your, at your transcripts. Um, so it didn't impact me um, at all, thankfully. Um, yeah, as, as I said, I, I, my, most of my struggles started happening in my graduate degree. So um, in terms of taking time off and, and having to deal with psychosis. Uh, but I can, I can say sort of a few things about grad, grad school applications. They've changed quite a bit over time. And the ability to actually say, you know, uh, indicate that you have a disability wasn't even present when I did my grad school applications. There has always been a place on grad school applications for explaining why you didn't do uh, particularly well in, in a particular year. That's usually a component of these applications. Likewise, if you're applying for uh, grant funding, like a, a fellowship to support your grad school application, there will usually be uh, some place to indicate if you've you know, had some sort of health issues or other issues in your life that have affected your progress. They will not generally ask for details. They just want to, they want a sense of what, what time range these events happened. In fact, I don't think they're allowed to ask for details. If you indicate it, it has to be taken as such. So you don't need to say I have bipolar disorder on your application. You can, you can say I, I struggled with some health issues uh, during this period of time. And that's all they, they really deserve to know at that time. They're assessing your application, not, not your mental, mental health. Um, so yeah, that, those are my two cents on that. I hope that helps. Thank you. It's it's I think particularly interesting to hear from um, you, Stephen, on that one as you know someone who's been uh, applying to grad school and then you know uh, uh, lecture yourself on the other side of the the coin. Um, and again, uh, you know I think like Tracy was saying, there's there's ways to talk about the. The positives of that time, whether it was used to get additional experience, it also shows some um, self awareness and planning. Grad school is a really stressful time, as I know as well, um, and to show that you kind of have a proactive strategy for managing your mental health can also be a, a really clear personal attribute to um, to talk about. Um, yeah, this just, question. Oh, sorry. I was going to say a little note on that. Um, I did choose a grad program that had the flexibility to do part time. Um, I know some programs don't, so I was yeah careful to choose one and apply for one. And let's, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Also, I just wanted to mention too, uh, related to that, um, all of that discussion related to grad school. There's no rush to go to grad school. I mean, if getting uh, additional experience like Tracy did in between your undergrad and your grad, um, you don't feel that you shouldn't also, in addition to not feeling like you need to complete your undergrad in four years, you shouldn't feel like you need to go directly into grad school. Um, another regret I have is just doing that route. Uh, most people um, who are in ac academia will, in retrospect, either say, I valued this time I took off between my degrees, or I, <laughs> or I suggest that you do this because I didn't do it. It's very common advice that's given. Um, yes, I can also add to that, that echo chamber. Sometimes I think I wish I'd taken a little bit of time to um, just wind down in between uh, those really intense, stressful periods in my life. Um, our next question might be, again, particularly pertinent to you, Stephen, as somebody who's been on the, the lecturing side of the coin. Um, but again, then also you, Tracy, who's had experiences of reaching out for that support. Um, so hi, panelists. I have a question on disclosure as a student. When I'm going through a tough few months, is it a good idea to disclose my diagnosis to my lecturer at the start of semester or only disclose when things get really bad? I don't want to seem like I'm asking for special treatment or attention either way, but from a lecturer's point of view, which is better? Early disclosure or waiting to see if things get bad? 
Um, okay, that's a great question. I, I preface um, my answer to the specifics of your question by saying that uh, in most universities, you don't need to disclose directly to the lecturer at all. Um, you, you, you usually have a center for accessibility, what it's called at UBC or some sort of accessibility office that you, dis you would then disclose to them and they manage uh, the disclosures, which aren't really true disclosures. They manage relating that information to your lecturer or professors to tell them that you're gonna be off or you're not well at this time, or you need extra time for exam. That way you're not having to negotiate with different people who might have different views of mental illness and, and um, what people deserve who have mental illness. It's not their business really. Um, and if you do want to disclose to, to your lecturer um, and you feel comfortable doing so, I don't think there's a, a good or bad time to do it. I, I would recommend doing it earlier rather than later if you are going to do it. But again, you know, try to work through your center for accessibility rather than, than having to feel like you have to approach your professor uh, to tell them this. Yeah, hope that helps. Yeah, some um, for the Center for Access and a, yeah, when you get a letter, like a, a letter for accommodations, you usually give it to your professor at the beginning of the school year. And depending on the school, the center could send it to your instructor directly, or you might be instructed to send it to your instructor. Um, either way, it's good to just kind of check and say, hey, I have these, like right at the beginning of the semester, I have these accommodations, I may need to use them. Um, so just kind of giving them a heads up. Um, yeah, so typically I would do that at the beginning of every semester. Thank you both. Sounds like earlier rather than later is, is um, better. And as a, somebody who's done teaching myself as well, I would say that it's, it always helps to know um, ahead of time if somebody's struggling, because then if we notice you not participating or perhaps um, it's an online course, um, not being online for a couple of weeks, we can reach out a little bit more proactively. Um, and of course, you know, sometimes the, the university system isn't consistent across um, different countries. We are, you know, speaking from quite a, a North American Canadian perspective. Um, in some cases, you may need to reach out um, directly to your professor. And um, if there isn't such a thing as an accessibility office, um, or if you're a first gen student, sometimes, you know, um, your professor will be willing to uh, to help you identify those supports. You know, we we want you to succeed. So we probably have time for um, one last question about um, uh, about studying before we skip in before we move into um, uh, take home statements. Um, so this question is, is not so much about accessing supports, but um, dealing with the, the mental health impacts. I, you and um, Tracy and Stephen both have talked about how depression in particular is really, um, was probably one of the most significant challenges you faced in, in terms of um, managing your studies. Um, this person asks, how do I make myself go to class when I'm depressed? I started skipping in second year and it's affecting my grades a lot. Sorry, Emma, can you just repeat the, the question again? I missed the first piece. Sure. Um, how do I make myself go to class when I'm depressed? I started skipping in second year and it's affecting my grades a lot. Um, go ahead, Tracy. <laughs> that's, for me, that's one thing about COVID that I, well, the program that I was in was going to be online anyway. Um, but for me, I, I personally love doing everything from home. Um, yeah, it can be hard to drag yourself out of the house to go to a lecture and sit and listen for a bit. Um, in terms, like maybe if you can make some friends in the class and then that way you have something to look forward to rather than just sitting in a lecture by yourself. Um, yeah, it can be fun to kind of make friends in class. Um, if there is a way for the lectures to be recorded, um, that could potentially be an accommodation that you can get or a note taker. Um, so the, the Center for Accessibility might be a good resource um, for that too. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would um, also comment that, um, based on what Tracy said, um, that, you know, one thing, and this is more of a political comment for me, um, 
So I, I think that, the, you know, COVID's been terrible. Um, online teaching has been sort of a mixed bag for people. Um, but one thing that people that we have gained over this time of, of using online teaching and developing online tools, even like I think about the way Zoom looked as an interface a year and a half ago and now how it looks now and how functional it is now. It's amazing. But one of the gains we've had during COVID is, is accessibility. People who couldn't otherwise uh, come to class, uh, maybe they're severely depressed and we're now able to attend from their bedroom even. Um, and that's, that's a major win. And I think, you know, uh, one thing we all have to keep in mind is that as we move potentially back in person, uh, we shouldn't get rid of all these gains we made. That's a major win um, to give uh, education such access for people, uh, people such access for, to education, um, that we shouldn't forget that. And, and going back to the original question about how, how to make yourself uh, attend class if you're depressed, it's a difficult thing to do. Um, I really like Tracy's suggestion of, of, you know, trying to make friends or even talking to your neighbors the first couple of days in class, just so you develop a relationship that then if you do have to miss class, you have someone who's a potential note taker and vice versa. You could do it for them. Um, that way you don't, you know, you're not as worried or feeling as upset if you miss a class because you're not alone in it. You're, you have other people with you or helping you through that course. Um, and, you know, group study skills and just learning, studying with other people as a group is a very effective study strategy in general, um, even if you're doing it remotely over Zoom. Thank you both for your thoughts on that one. It's obviously a really challenging uh, question to distill an answer to in a couple of minutes. You know, the, the, the you know uh, a takeaway we'd probably want people to be having is you know to be seeking support in addition to all of these um, behavioral strategies. Finding the the motivation to go um, uh, can be challenging to do on your own, and it's it's really ideal if you can have um, a peer support network or a healthcare provider who can help you um, troubleshoot um, ways to find that motivation, whether it's social or structuring something positive into that day. Like I always used to treat myself to a really fancy coffee at the times when I was struggling to get into um, uh, my own courses, you know, something to um, to find that motivation. Um, but yeah, it's, it's uh, really great to hear you, Stephen, talk about the benefits of this online format. And I think that that's something that we at Crest are looking to continue as well with um, uh, the way that we share information because uh, the advantage of this Talk PD series is that we've been able to reach a much broader audience than we have in the past. And, and we wanna keep that, that sharing going. Um, there are lots of good things that we can take away, I hope, from, from this pandemic. Um, so what I'd like to do before uh, we move into uh, wrapping up and sharing some resources uh, is to ask, Stephen and Tracy, um, what is the one, number one take home message that you'd like people attending today to keep in mind when it comes to studying and mental health? And maybe I'll go to Stephen first. Uh, okay, so thank, thanks, Emma. I, I, I would say the most important message I have for people studying um, with a mental illness, be it bipolar disorder or some other mental illness, um, is to don't feel like, I've already said this a few times, but don't feel like you need to rush through your degree, um, nor feel that you have to um, rush through your degree. Enjoy it and, and try to take the time that you need to stay healthy while you're doing it. Thank you. And Tracy? Yeah, I echo that. Um, if, if it seems that your mental health and you can, you know, identify that it's your mental health is getting in the way of being able to focus on school and, and do well and get those, you know, high grades, if that's what you're going for, um, to, to not try to push through it, but to, to, if you can, step back, get the support you need, learn ways of coping that work for you, um, and then just gradually build on it. Um, it, it can take a while for a your brain to heal from uh, mental health, whatever it might be. Um, for me, it was psychosis, which was a huge thing to recover from. Um, and, and keep stress levels low. Um, no need to be super stressed out. Like there's no need. <laughs> you can find that low stress place that's like a good. You, where you feel good about it. Yeah. 
Thank you once again um, to Stephen and Tracy for sharing your experiences, both as people who have been on the, um, uh, who have given support and who have uh, received support. And I think that um, talking openly about this is really valuable in um, breaking down some of those self-imposed expectations um, that, that we have about what studying should be like and what success at school should be. Um, and I really like what you said there at the end, Tracy, about remembering to enjoy this time, you know, um, we pursue education because it can add value to our, our lives and our careers, but it should also be fun to, to learn. And um, uh, I think finding ways to make that possible uh, is, is really important uh, for, mental health, whether you are living with a mental illness or not. So since we're getting close to the end, um, what I'd like to do is uh, share some of our Crest resources. Um, so everything that we've been talking about in the chat today, uh, we have put in a Google Doc um, that Laura has shared. Um, so this includes links to our Bipolar Wellness Centre. And this is a web page where we have collected um, evidence-based strategies shared by both um, clinicians and academics and people with lived experience about how to maintain well-being um, when you have bipolar disorder. And we do have a page specifically about study, um, how this can impact your quality of life and some specific resources that might be um, useful for, for you. Uh, one of those is a video with our own Stephen Barnes about studying bipolar disorder and um, how to navigate that uh, disclosure and support seeking process. Uh, and if you are based in the Vancouver area, you may like to look at um, Kaleidoscope, the peer support organization that Tracy is president of, um, to learn a little bit more about some of the, um, the help that they might be able to provide. Uh, we have a Crest BD quality of life tool. Um, this is a really useful resource to kind of Take the temperature of how you're doing, not just in terms of your symptoms, but your overall quality of life. And this can help you identify areas that you are flourishing and areas that might need some more attention. Uh, we have our Crest BD website where you can sign up to our newsletter. Um, this is where you can get informed about uh, any upcoming studies or events that we're having like this Talk BD. Um, you can view all of our previous TalkBD events at talkbd.live um, and also on our YouTube page, um, as I think it's worth having a look at, given that um, Stephen was talking about uh, the financial impacts that, that students deal with. Um, we do have a TalkBD specifically about money and bipolar disorder, and I think that one will be worth taking a look at. Um, we're always looking for ways to improve these events, um, so please do consider taking this brief survey afterwards. Um, let us know what was helpful, um, what you'd like to see more of, uh, and if you'd like if, us to talk about any specific topics, you can also leave suggestions there. Uh, we'd like to issue a heartfelt thanks to our funders and partners who make all of these events possible. Uh, and we'd like to share uh, the ways that you can keep in touch with Crest. Um, we have an Instagram account and we also have presences on Facebook, Twitter and um, YouTube. So please do join us there. Uh, our next talk BD is hotly anticipated and uh, we will be talking about the use of psychedelic medicines when you have bipolar disorder with Dr. Josh Woolley and that will be happening on November 22nd. So do remember to sign up to our social media or newsletter um, and you can submit your questions in advance. Uh, it will be a really exciting talk.